So next, we want to start talking about some of the other stressors that we haven't touched on yet. So the first one's going to be pollution. And I think you. And uh, while we have, there's many aspects we can talk about pollution, I think a great example uh, of this is um, the, the pollution, the, the pollutant that everybody seems to be talking about this day, uh, these days, which revolves around plastic. Before we talk about that, though, I want to just remind you guys that, uh, again, um, as you guys have found from all the different threats we've been looking at, um, and as our finding, depending on whatever your stressor is in your write-ups, right, the pollution always falls out as number one. Every year, however we phrase it, whatever sub-questions or variants we ask, people always think pollution is a big thing. Um, in the case of plastics, plastics really do, uh, really are a, a very clear signal of our age, as is things such as uh, radioactive deposition and a few other uh, things that are very, very obvious. So we're, you and I, we're, we're humans to be somehow magically all killed tomorrow, right? And a million years from now, the buildings have crumbled and this and that. We could still see in the geological record, in the, in the DNA of the planet, we could see the signal of our civilization um, in the plastic that it presents. Now, I used to show this one video, which was a sort of a cartoon um, propaganda video, um, but it's now left YouTube. So I'm going to show you a few minutes of another old um, educational video just to sort of uh, uh, make the point about um, the, the historic perception of plastics. Hmm. Of the elements in the soil, water, air, and the energy of sunlight, nature produces an almost infinite variety of plants. Plants that supply us with food. Plants that provide the raw material for our clothing. Plants from which are fashioned innumerable necessities and luxuries. All this organic or living material is produced by nature out of air, water, and the soil. A tree is a good example of this synthesis of natural substances. From the atmosphere, it takes carbon and oxygen in the form of carbon dioxide. Then, from the soil, it takes water and such elements as nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. With the aid of sunlight, nature combines these elements to make the tree. Although this tree has its own particular structure, its basic elements are essentially the same as in all species of plants. The wood of the tree is made up of cellulose fibers held together tightly or bonded by natural resins. For centuries, man has taken this natural product from the forests and used it practically unchanged. By a number of operations, cutting to size, sawing, planing, machining, and shaping, innumerable useful products have been made such as this wooden radio cabinet, which in finished form is still like all wood, composed of cellulose fibers bonded by natural resin. So the rhetoric here is everything is natural, right? Nothing but many to products formerly made of wood or other materials can now be made with greater ease and improved design out of relatively new materials we familiarly call plastic. The plastic material of this radio cabinet is also composed of cellulose fibers. But the fibers are bonded by a synthetic resin, a resin made by man. Not women. Like all plastic, the material of this cabinet, which is a phenolic compound, is made from substances found in nature. Just as the tree takes elements from air, water, and the soil, and with the aid of sunlight, grows and develops. So to make the phenolic plastic, we also take elements from nature. For example, one method of making phenolic plastic utilizes coal, air, and water. In this method, we begin by heating and okay. refining the coal to get a substance called phenol. Okay, so you guys get the idea. That wasn't as fun as my old cartoon, but it, it, it's, it's, hey, magical substance. Hey, wondrous material. Hey, look at all this cool stuff. We can replace these old things with this. And by the way, it's no different from anything else. 
It's just like a tree. It's just like a, a blade of grass with just a little bit of extra chemistry. <clears throat> so we first figured out plastics is a thing, is, is a hyd linked chains of repetitive hydrocarbon units, polymers. First really started turning that into some useful stuff um, over 100 years ago. But really it was, and we had plastics before World War II, but really it was World War II, that, that World War I initially, but then really World War II that really drove the massive uh, understanding and innovations around plastics and plastic products. So here's a quote from uh, 1945 in this book about plastics, about the dawn of the so-called plastic age, right? So we have the space age, the atomic age, all this kind of stuff. So it is a world, so this is uh, these guys talking about um, plastics. It is a world free from moth and rust and full of color, a world largely built up of synthetic materials made from the most universally distributed substances, a world in which nations are more and more independent of localized natural resources. So presumably that, that's viewed as a good thing. Um, a world in which man, again, no women here, just men, a world in which man, like a magician, makes what he wants for almost every need out of what is beneath and around him, right? So, so leaving the sexist thing and all that jazz aside, it's very much an optimistic vision, right? Like, hey, this is great. It's gonna be, it's gonna benefit society. It's gonna benefit our, our economy and all that kind of good stuff. There's essentially, there's, there's um, environmental justice embedded in there, right? If you're, if you're from an area with poor resources, you shouldn't suffer, right? So there's some, there's some aspirational talk and, and very much so plastic was built around um, an aspirational um, uh, newness and freshness and hope kind of thing. So here's another quote, this, this case from 2009, obviously with, with an, an, another half century of perspective. Um, the durability of plastics and their potential for diverse applications, including widespread use as, a, as disposable items, were anticipated, but the problems associated with waste management and plastic debris were not. In fact, the predictions were how much brighter and cleaner a world it would be than that which preceded this plastic age, Sensu, that quote we just heard from. So, uh, plastic is, a, is, the, is now the classic example of a, of a coastal contaminant or, or, or problematic pollutant. Um, now, some folks would argue that, oh no, it's just a waste management issue. If we could properly manage our waste, we wouldn't have any plastic contamination everywhere else. That appears to be false. Um, uh, we are now, we here at CSCCI are isolating plastics from the air that you're breathing right now, from the rainwater. It truly does appear to be across in every bio, every, 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 every ecosystem, every nook of the planet, we're finding plastics in, in, in that uh, location, in those locations. Um, although the folks that say this isn't a problem just say it's a waste management issue like this. Um, pretty much everywhere we look, uh, conspicuously areas that move large, that there's large wind movement patterns or large water movement patterns, we see the, uh, uh, the accruing of large pieces of, of plastic debris. And even in these places like this beach, that's full of microplastics, right? So those of you, anybody in Dr. Steele's cons bio class? So she has you guys do microplastics now, right? So you, yes or no? Yes. yes. Okay. So you guys, so you guys have seen this, right? So a lot of you guys have already seen this. So, so right. So the point is, if we take any scoop of this sand and filter it um, with very simple procedures, and some of you guys are doing this for your capstone, uh, you, you will find uh, pieces of plastic. Quick side note here for you guys for completion. For those of you that have that will not be taking Dr. Uh, Wu's coastal contaminants class. Um, just a real quick overview of how we think about poisoning. How we think about poisoning is the field of toxicology, the study of poisons. The field of toxicology was really birthed, anybody, anybody want to take a guess as to when what we consider the, the study of poisons really flourished mostly across the planet? Mm. Good guess, but no, before World War I, not wars. Not the Black Plague, but you're getting close. Nope. When we had 
all of these fiefdoms and, and uh, uh, kingdoms, et cetera, across uh, Europe. Europe was really the epicenter of poison inventions. There were poisons invented all over the world for all kinds of uses, but really where it came into its, its uh, sort of laid the groundwork for flourishing were in all these imperial courts and things like that in Europe. Why? Because the, because the royalty had to marry royalty. Weren't allowed to marry peasant people. So you had a very small population. And there's only one king at a time, or one queen at a time. So if you wanted to be the next king, and your brother, let's say, was king, and he was about your same age, you're screwed, right? So poisoning really, really flourished. So everybody was poisoning. That's when you guys, all the you know, court tasters, you guys, all the people make all these jokes about people tasting the food. That was a real thing, because people's food would frequently be poisoned. So these guys came up with all kinds of crazy uh, new ways of poisoning people uh, several hundred years ago in Europe. The U new United States of America started pulling in all these immigrants from a lot of places, including Europe, right? And so these folks brought this technology with them. So in the late 1800s, poisoning was, was a common way to get rid of an enemy in the cramped urban areas of the eastern seaboard, the big giant uh, cities. And it was becoming so, um, so ubiquitous that, that the police, investigative folks, started to figure out we need to understand what poisons do, and we need to understand what poison effects there are, and we need to understand what's a dangerous level of thing, of, of a substance or not. And that, basically in the crime labs of New York City, um, there was birthed with chemists and other scientists uh, was, was birthed the field of what we now call toxicology, the study of poisons, the modern study of poisons. This is essentially the, the main story of poisoning or danger from a pollutant. This is called, uh, so on the bottom here I have an exposure or concentration or dose, sometimes you refer to that as dose of the substance. And this is any substance, this could be water, this could be lead, this could be radiation, whatever. And then on the y-axis we have some measure of the effect that that compound is going to have on that, that individual. There are multiple possible curves, type 1 curves, 2 curves, 3 curves, but basically we start low on the lower left hand side where we have some amount of that toxin introduced into the system and there's no observable effect, no real effect. On the far right, we have some level where the concentration is such that it's always going to have effect, or it's going to kill everything, or it's going to always have some, some consequence, right? And so basically, the, the, the early part of um, toxicology was all about figuring out the shape of this curve for different substances, and figuring out what's an acceptable level of that toxin. What's an acceptable level of lead in your blood? What's an acceptable level of copper in your blood? That kind of stuff. So that's the modern field of um, toxicology. Um, we have learned a lot since the, since the founding, the birth of uh, the field of modern toxicology. And we have all kinds of additional insights now. So now we understand that it's actually more complicated than just that, that simple or core so-called dose response curve. One of the first things, one of the classic examples is on the upper left. Now, have you guys, have you guys talked about this in any other classes? Um, so this, was, this, this story comes from just immediate post-World War II Japan. And this is a bay, in J coastal, coastal embayment in Japan where they had a plant that one of the things the plant produced was mercury. So they were leaking a lot of mercury out into the water. And that mercury is, um, can be what's called methylated, which means it makes it biologically available. So it can stick to fat, essentially, and, and, and stay in animals' tissues. And so as a consequence, the worms had a lot of uh, mercury in their tissues. The fish had a lot of mercury in their tissues, etc. So when people ate that, humans got exposed to high levels of mercury, and so we saw all kinds of deformities, physical deformities, uh, mental impacts, all kinds of stuff. And at first, nobody knew what was going on. It was just these people in this one area, and so, um, so now people refer to Minamata disease, which was essentially exposure to high levels of mercury. Um, uh, we 
I can see, yeah. Uh, you can, you can, yeah. I mean, if it, it affects, if you had a high enough dosage, and yeah, it could absolutely affect your mental processing and stuff like that. There was a Chinese emperor who would drink mercury with his teeth and not it make it healthier. Yeah. That's right. I mean, I mean, there's all kinds of crazy, interesting stories. So some people argue that's one of the reasons why the Roman Empire fell, because they had lead-lined pipes, and they were getting slowly lead poisoned. Uh, Benjamin Franklin and some of our founding fathers used to take a lead dollop, a lead pill, and put it in their wine, because it made the wine taste a little sweeter. So I mean, there's all these crazy things that, that we historically have done under misimpressions or not understanding the risks of different substances. Um, so yeah, there are all these crazy things. A um, couple other quick examples. Um, on the, on the right-hand side, uh, uh, this is uh, toxicity. And in this case, this was a, um, uh, uh, s what would happen if we spilled a, a um, cargo of coal on a coral reef? Surprise, surprise, it's going to kill the babies. Um, one of the things that really came along, uh, one of the biggest inventions for us, or innovations for us, is this notion of, um, using model organisms or so-called bioassays. And so on the lower right, lower left, excuse me, is an amphipod that's a very popular uh, organism to use in our coastal and marine environments. And so the idea here is um, this is a short-lived critter, small-bodied critter, so we can have a lot of them. If we have a limited lab space, we can have a lot of them, right? And so they, their generation time is, is pretty quick. So we can take this critter expose it to whatever the level of the compound is in the water or what have you, and look at the response, either the sublethal response, which is, would be their behavior, their breathing, something like that, or just how many straight up die. Uh, and, and there's all kinds of other ecological consequences and, and theory that, is, that has been brought into toxicology from other areas of um, biological sciences and elsewhere to explain the patterns that we see. Okay, so that, that's very quickly uh, introduction to toxicology, right? So dose response curves are a key part of understanding what's going on. I should have said one other thing uh, is that uh, we, have envir we have a new category of toxins that we had not understood before. Everything else behaves this way. These things are completely different. These things usually ref are usually fall under the rubric of environmental endocrines or endocrine disruptors. So what these compounds do, so, so we're all of the theory or virtually all the theory of toxicity effect of pollutants is built on, hey, if I go to the right on this graph, I'm going to go up, I'm going to go up on the, on the y axis, right? Might not go up a lot, but I'm going to go up, right? So as I move farther and farther to the right, as my concentration of whatever the substance is goes up, I'm going to have more of an impact on my critter. Right? Everybody with me? There's another class of compound. And also, this is basically, by and large, uh, high concentrations of things. We've, we began to realize it, and, and the first insights were all uh, coastal and marine. Uh, of a new, this new category of stuff called endocrine disruptors, and these are firstly occurring at very, very small concentrations, parts per million to parts per billion. So it wasn't until the last few decades we even had the technology to consistently measure these substances. All of these substances are human-created, synthesized substances, mostly invented since World War II, mostly of or relating to plastics. Not all. Some are pesticides. But, but a lot of them are other related to plastics. What these things do is they screw with your body's orchestra. So particular, mo most obvious when we're developing. So as we're developing, there's all these things, right? That this tissue, that my liver tissue is somehow talking to my spinal column and that thing's making the this, this blood vessel grow and all that kind of incredible dance of, that, that goes into making you, right? So what we discovered is with these so-called environmental estrogens, if we take, firstly, an incredibly small concentration on the order of a, a drop in, in let's say, uh, five or six volumes of Sierra Hall here. I mean, very, very, very small concentration, probably even, even smaller concentration than that. 
as we release these substances, I suppose these substances, if we, if we gave it a concentration X on day seven to the baby developing embryo, nothing, no effect. Baby grows up like a normal, normal rabbit or normal mouse, normal whatever. If we give it on day eight, no effect. Day nine, no effect. Day 10, massive deformation. Maybe it doesn't even live. Or when, you do, or when it does grow up, has problems, health problems, all this and that. Give it on day 11, 12, 13, 14, no effect. So rather than following this typical, a little bit more is a little bit worse, it's different. It's the timing of exposure. Completely different, massively more complicated to figure out what the impact of that is. And it's much more challenging to predict uh, for areas we haven't collected data, much more difficult to predict what the ecological consequences of such toxins would be. We are producing more and more such environmental estrogens every day. And so it's a mounting threat, but it's hard to know the scale of the threat. The magnet, so we, again, like I said, really the story of, of plastics when we talk about plastic pollution really got going uh, post-World War II. So post-World War II, we're in a big building boom. As you saw in that little video, oh my God, it's so great. Now we can make our radios out of plastic instead of making them out of wood and, and what have you. Um, this is uh, an analysis from some colleagues at UCSB that did the best, so far, the best worldwide measure of how much, how much plastic have we created. So um, uh, basically a small, small, small subset is recycled and repurposed. A huge amount is discarded. And so this 4,900, that that's in millions of metric tons, right? So that's billions, that's 4.9 billion metric tons actively, discard actively discarded, right? That's a huge amount of stuff. So much so that we're finding it everywhere. As I just said, we're finding it in the rainwater now, we're finding it in air, we're also finding it in all kinds of critters. So in this case, this is a, a piece of, pla and, and anything smaller than five millimeters we call, we define as a microplastic. Just, it's just an operational definition, right? Basically we have a big chunk of something, it gets broken up by wave action, it gets broken up by sun, ultraviolet, whatever, and it goes into smaller pieces. So once it gets to a certain stage, we call, it, we call that, that um, microplastic. And what you're looking at here, this is an image. This is um, uh, some tissue of an intertidal muscle. So the green is the muscle tissue. In this case, it's a blood cell. And the yellow is a piece of plastic. So we're finding this substance not just only in the air, in the sediment, et cetera, but we're finding actually whole pieces in the tissues of critters. And the critters that you eat, the critters that I eat, the critters that we encounter all day long. Um, again, this is, uh, after this we'll, we'll leave the toxicology realm, but just to, to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, bisphenol A is a type of uh, uh, thing that, that makes plastic more, more malleable. So it makes this water bottle, I can squeeze it like this and it bends, but it doesn't crack. So bisphenol A is used to make things more um, pliable. Uh, estradiol is a major uh, uh, sort of uh, building block for a lot of plastics. Here's mercury, here's lead, here's acetaminophen, that medicine that probably you guys all have in your medicine cabinet at home, if not in your purses and pockets at the moment, and then just uh, plastic particles. And so uh, this, is, this is a sense of, so this here is low observe, or lowest observed effect level. So this is the concentration where if we take a critter expose this critter to this substance, well, we see at least something. Maybe it doesn't kill it, but there's some kind of effect. In other words, the, the substance is having some impact on the organism. And so uh, some of the stuff is in the part per billion range, in some cases in the parts per million range. But as we look more and more and have more and more sophisticated tools, these concentrations are dropping. So this is the concentration that we and, and, and there's various endpoints, but these, these are some representative concentrations where we might see some impact. Then over here is the concentration that we see it in the environment uh, where we've looked. And so in some cases, um, uh, things are right at, or just about everything, uh, things are, are near or at the concentration where we can see ecological levels of impact. We don't know yet what those impacts are, but we do know that there are some type of impacts. 
Oh, sorry, and I did define CEC is contaminant of emerging concern. So that would be things like acetaminophen. So we don't technically have a, a name for those things. So the, the catch-all term is contaminant of emerging concern. So something that probably will be regulated as a pollutant in the future, but right now it's not. So there's all kinds of knowns and all kinds of unknowns here. A lot of what plays into the, the toxicity of any of these marine and coastal pollutants is the ecology of the system, the natural history of the system, how organisms behave, how water and different uh, substances move across the landscape or the, the aquatic sphere. And so that's really, really key. So just saying that a substance is problematic in the lab doesn't necessarily translate to being a problem in the field. Saying something is not a problem in the field does not mean it's necessarily safe. Uh, excuse me. Saying something is, is, is uh, safe in the lab doesn't mean it's necessarily safe in the field. So we really need to pull in. So the historic thing was ask a chemist, have a chemist go do something. And we now know that's, that's a great step. That's a key step. But we need folks like you guys. We need folks that understand more of the interdisciplinary nature of these coastal systems to really understand potential real world concentrations, potential real world consequences of such exposures. Perhaps the, the most obvious thing that you guys have heard about or that people talk about a lot are these uh, plastic, um, these concentrations of plastics in the ocean. Um, and this is, again, building on the stuff we, we've covered, but sort of gross physical oceanography and, and, and circulation of different ocean basins um, uh, leads to all kinds of stuff. And I just know that it's a 3D process, even though we're sh we show it as a two-dimensional process. And so we get things like these so-called um, uh, giant Pacific garbage patch or patches or great Pacific garbage patches. And so um, they're often in the media portrayed as two areas. There are really many more than this, and it's really, every day it's more and more ubiquitous, but these are areas where the concentration is more elevated than the areas outside of these, these places. Um, these, these guys are each about the size, roughly, of the state of Texas, and um, there's a lot of plastic out there. And they're just spinning, spinning, spinning. They're actually spinning the opposite way, but that's fine. So again, as I said, microplastics are defined as less than five millimeters. And it's where all plastics end up. Big plastics will always end up as small plastics. They don't necessarily go away. So we have a couple different flavors of plastics. Um, one, that's the most conspicuous target, the easiest thing to absolutely prove that you and I made it, are these machine things. So not only is it chemically a substance that we made from petroleum products, but it's also um, machine to be a certain act action. So in this case, these are the so-called um, uh, microbeads or microspheres. So these are machined to be completely circular. So the idea with this is uh, this was super popular. In fact, you guys maybe still have some of these in your in your cabinets, whatever. Makeups were one of the first ones. So we're, we're in, when you want to put on your your color, or whatever, and you want it to smoothly go across, or you want it to clump up on your cheek, you want it to spread. So the idea is having something that will help help the makeup spread around. Another very common one was toothpaste. So we want some amount of abrasiveness when they when they rush their teeth, right? So um, the idea is again coming from the perspective of this thing is this miracle product. It's inert. It's not bad for us. It's a neutral thing, right? So why not use it? Why not put it in toothpaste? Why not put it in all these different substances? Um, so that, those are microbeads or microspheres. Um, this stuff is everywhere. So I first encountered microplastics here in the, this picture on the left is from the 1980s. So this is a fish called a rainbow runner. Uh, and this is collected off of Southern California by our friends doing what's called the Cal Coffee Monitoring Data Set, one of the data sets you might have seen when we were playing around with the uh, offshore data sets, the, uh, the algal bloom data sets. Anyway, um, so this is just a regular old fish just caught in the, I don't know, 200 miles off the coast, 300 miles off the coast of California, something like that. Sliced open the, the belly, the stomach, and this was all inside of this fish, right? And this is going on all across the planet, everywhere. Um, you know, this stuff is, is everywhere. Um, so in addition to those, to those microbeads, we have these pieces, which again are just sort of jagged, broken down uh, nurdles, people refer them to, or, or microplastic pieces. And um, everywhere we've looked, we've found these in terms of surface waters, or virtually everywhere. So here, this is some data from a few years ago, but obviously the hotter the color, the, um, the, 
the more plastics we found, and so we found them off South America, and this is from a transects across the ocean. Um, they're just all over the place. Um, there is some variability to where these, so some areas have more than others, but the key thing for us is all these areas have them. We've actually found them in many different places uh, as well. So we began our investigations looking at sandy beaches because we do a lot of work on sandy beaches. And so these are all, this is the, these are the first 15 beach areas we sampled, Hawaii, Cook Islands, California, Caribbean, et cetera, Mediterranean, everybody had them. Since then we did a expanded study. This has actually just been published um, this year, or just being published this year. But um, what we're looking at here are these beaches from Northern California to Southern California. So on the, on the um, uh, left-hand side, we're in Northern California. On the right-hand side, we are in um, San Diego County. And the red is the number of microfibers, and the yellow is, is the pieces, the, those broken nurdle pieces of plastic. So pretty much almost everything you're wearing right now has micro, is shedding microfibers. So your underwear, your tennis shoes, your, your, your shirts probably, right? And so that, that comprises the majority of what we see. So the red bars here are the largest. This actually doesn't show the microbeads, but, but they're, they're rarer than particles. But the point is, every single beach we've ever looked at, we see them on. Now, but if you have a look, some, such as Water Canyon on Santa Rosa, relatively clean, right? Relatively clean. Still have them there but they're not as abundant as, say, Carpinteria, which has orders of magnitude more plastic. So um, there, there, there must be some type of you know, forcing factor here, and some of you guys are doing your capstones on trying to figure this out in certain areas, farmland, et cetera. But um, there's no super, super, super obvious pattern, right? There isn't Northern California, Southern California. It isn't at the urban cores, there's tons, and away from the urban cores, there's nothing, right? Because look, here's Santa Cruz Island. Santa Cruz Island has about as much as Carpinteria, right? And so there's, there's no error bars on here, but suffice it to say that, there, that we, we have the error measurements. So there's, there's non-obvious structure. And so far, it looks like there's just this soup of this stuff, right? Yeah. It looks it's, like a lot of the lower ones are close to offshore canyons. Mm-hmm. Could be. When we've, when we've tried some more detailed looking at it, that there doesn't appear to be any significant correlation. So it might be the case that we just need a, a thousand more samples. The data is so, so noisy, we need more. Um, but a great project for any of you guys who are looking for a project. If you don't have a capstone, if you're gonna do capstone next year, great project to, to try to see, look for pattern in all this data. We're getting more and more data every year, not just us, but our colleagues and, and friends all around the planet. And so um, this is a really curious uh, thing here. So here's what we see. Here's another important part of the story in terms of marine and plastic, uh, marine and coastal debris. Um, all right, so here we go. So uh, let's talk about how many, uh, how much of this plastic we see around. So uh, this is from an interesting uh, uh, paper, and these guys sailed the ship around the, the world and were taking samples of surface water, et cetera. And this is what they found, so here we go. So this is what they predicted they would see. So, so the red line here, so if it's too small in the back, if you guys can't see it, it says normalized abundance of plastic in items or, or pieces uh, per cubic millimeter, okay? So this is, this is just a measure of abundance. So they predicted is that, and, this, and on, on this here, this is size, right? So they predicted is, here we go, here's super small dudes. Everybody with me? Super small dudes, or, or super, excuse me, where am I? Super small size particles, big size particles. So obviously the first pattern is more small things than big. That makes sense, right? Because a, a big bag breaks down into 20 little pieces, et cetera. But this is what they predicted based on physics. This red is what they based on people that didn't take ESRM, right? This is what they, this is what they predicted based on just the UV, the physical smashing together of waves and that kind of stuff. What they found was blue. So down here, in the bigger part of the range, they were essentially finding what they, what they thought they would find. But as they got smaller and smaller, they were finding less of what they thought they would find in the open water. Why do you think that might be? Because that's what the animals can Right. 
So this is a physics model. This is not a biological model. So what this is saying is we, we expected, we, we expect there, even, even though I just said there's microplastics everywhere, we expect there to be even more plastic than we see. So Vincent's right. So what's going on is things are eating these. Th so, so just like we talked about the, um, the uh, stability of the ocean, right? The homeostasis of the ocean where we have this calcium going and then at some point that calcium is incorporated into the shells of critters and, and biological action pulls it out of the system. That's what's happening here. Biological action is pulling the freely floating plastic out of the, the ocean and critters are ingesting it. Either they're thinking it's food and they're trying to consume it or just by their natural filtration process it gets stuck. It, either way, for the purpose of this display, it doesn't matter, right? The action of life is, is filtering out small plastic particles. Um, and we see it all over the place. We see it down in the deep ocean. We see it in critters that leave in the deep ocean, like corals. Um, all over the place we find these guys. Um, and, and this plastic is a ubiquitous uh, aspect of what's going on. So we'll talk more about that later. But that's, that's the new the new marine pollutant du jour. Uh, plastic represents every single type of, to of toxicity that we know of short of radiation. So it can smother things, it can physically block, uh, like we're, we're, we're our, our, our sea turtle, right? It can physically get in the mouth of, a, of an animal and, and hurt them by physically obstructing their normal processes or digestion. It can act as a toxin. Um, and, and everything in between. So it's pretty crazy. Um, yes, so here's some examples of some of this guy. We're seeing this in our food chains in different ways, different way we measure it. And here's an example of a recent management debate about, uh, this is from two years ago, but we'll just listen to it really quickly. This is about, this was a ballot initiative on a previous election. Right. So uh, this debate has been sort of caught up in what kind of bag you use, right? Our most recent, our most recent issue is the, um, the signing of the governor just a couple weeks ago of our first uh, straw, plastic straw ban, right? Similarly, huge pushback from the straw manufacturers of the world, right? Uh, plastic, yeah, just try drinking out of a paper straw, dude, right? You would have thought that someone murdered someone, right? What that law says is not every place. It just says people that do a large serving of, of uh, food items should not automatically give you a plastic straw. That's all it says. It doesn't say that they can't give you a straw. You just have to ask for it. Even that small little thing, is that going to have a difference? No, but it's the first step in, in trying to have a conversation about our plastic, our plastic consumables, disposables. Uh, really amazing pushback has, has been observed uh, in the wake of that. And we'll see. It hasn't gone into effect yet. It doesn't go into effect until January. But, um, uh, yes, interesting. Um, okay, so as we talked about, all kinds of uh, stuff's going into the land. Um, lots of countries do a poor job of this. Um, uh, China is the worst by far, but it's just because we have them do all of our pollutant making. So, so yes, China is messed up in this issue, but we're all responsible because we're using the products, we're buying the products, we're supporting the system that uh, shunts our waste over there. Um, and just like we can do predictions, we, can, and we can't predict maybe the ecological consequences yet of all this plastic and this, and this marine debris, but we certainly can estimate, um, if we stay on the same trajectory, how much more plastic we're going to be producing and essentially we're going to be making more of it. And there's going to be more and more and more of it. And one of the most famous uh, quotes that everybody has been quoting is within a few years, we're going to, I think it's 20, 2030, we're going to have more 
individual pieces of plastic in the ocean than living fish. So is that right or not? Who knows? But again, it, it serves to have the conversation about management and how do we deal with these, with these uh, items. Um, and ultimately, it's, it all has to do with um, how we make this. So here's, here's another example just to finish up uh, about, um, uh, you know, sometimes we get, get into a problem because we don't realize a substance has an effect. In many cases, we get to the place, we get to the problem level because the substance has behaved exactly as we designed it. And that's the case of a lot of our marine toxins and coastal toxins. So this is an old uh, ad for stuff called uh, z sparus old paint. This is super toxic metals. And the idea here is um, this guy's painting it on the bottom of his, on the if, we, if we zoom in on that guy, this, he's, he's painting on the bottom of his boat because this stuff is super poisonous and, it, and the fouling organisms that normally land on his hull that he has to clean off and is labor intensive and is a pain in the butt, this stuff is super deadly. And so the boring critters and whatever have a much harder time establishing. So it saves him time and money and he can go drink some beer, right? Um, right? Again, this is, this is advertised as the large, late, in this case, this is like 30 years ago, the latest, most powerful toxic agents obtainable, improved poison power, right? So surprise, surprise, now that we had all, all these, these copper and tin and TBT, different substances coating the bottoms of our ship holds, hulls, in those ports and harbors now, they're totally toxic, right? The sediments are super poisonous. That wasn't an accident, that was completely predictable. When you take poisons and throw a bunch of poisons in the environment, surprise, surprise, poisons poison things. So again, plastics are persistent because we've designed them to be persistent. We've designed them to be really robust and, and this bottle will last a long time and that's what they do. So we shouldn't be surprised that they are having that um, impact and we see this all, all over the place. Okay, uh, 10 minute stretch.